That's the second it's meeting day in October. Based on our last conversation, is this really even appropriate to be on the agenda until it comes yeah. from It was planning. an update. It was never nothing before the council. Was I move to well. postpone this indefinitely. Second. Main that, second. That's a Walmart issue. Motion, motion made to postpone indefinitely. Is there a second? A second. Made and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> number 11, multifamily dwellings appendix ordinance number changed from 2124 to 2142. This will be the second reading. Second. Okay. Made and seconded. Discussion? Mr. Berry. Uh, we received some paperwork, and from what I'm seeing in the paperwork, it appears that uh, we need to remove 17 and a half Elk Street from the list of dwellings. Uh, a question for the clerk. Uh, unfortunately, with, with everything going on, I haven't had a chance to review it, but I don't remember the, I've got that up with, uh, that the attachment uh, C as proposed in the ordinance, which should read Victorian Residential R1, it was even read during the first reading. Is there any, what do you remember or? The list was not read. Okay, so is the first reading even, since it, that was the, the crux of the Ordinance that those residences weren't read in Appendix C. This was read, but the appendices this was not the read. Appendices that are being attached are not typically read as part of it because they're being adopted uh, as a list or as a code. Now, if you want to read them so that the general audience knows about what you're discussing, that's fine. But it's not required when you're adopting something uh, by reference been. that that entire document be read. I mean, when the building codes are adopted, you certainly don't sit here and read 500 or 1,000 pages of building code. That. And, but since this is a rather short and you are still only on your second reading, it would not be improper <coughs> to read that as part of the, if you so desire this time. Point of procedure: uh, Is it proper to discuss this, or do we need to to propose to suspend the rules and second reading, and then discuss, or can we discuss it without reading it? Or what's the if the only amendment that we're going to make is just adding the list to it? Well, there's some other things that okay. I have some okay. grave concern yeah. about, and I want to make sure it's discussed at the need right to time. Go ahead and suspend the rules. Read it. <coughs> and then move to suspend the rules and read. Read on the second reading, is that correct? Second reading to include Appendix C. Title only, but include Appendix C. I think it's important that these get in the record. Without, without 17 and a half Elk Street. Okay. That's in Appendix C right now. Well, we've already read. Of course, that's, I need a second. I don't know if somebody seconded or not. We're just going to oh, yeah. we can discuss it. That's what I'm trying to get to. I mean, we're, we're still in discussion, I'm assuming, so. Well, I mean, we haven't had a second on the motion yet, too. Well, we still are on the motion to discuss. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, why would we want to read Appendix C when we've got the top one wrong? That's why I was asking the question of procedure. Do we need to go ahead and propose to read it on its second reading with all the discussion that we want to have on it? Well, it wasn't read on the first reading, is this my understanding? Is that correct? Okay. So to add this, it has to be amended to add it. And then you vote on the amended motion, which is the addition to and, and the deletion of. And I don't have a problem with, with reading Appendix C with the, with the deletion of item number one at 17 and a half Elk Street. 
Yes, because it's pretty obvious that one doesn't come Absolutely. Okay. Um, but I think it's a really good idea to read the list so that if there are others that don't conform, people could let us could know. We get, could we get an attorney? Yes, we can. <laughs> I, uh, I we, asked we on the right track twice. Track. My suggestion would be that you don't go ahead and put it on a second reading, but that you make a motion or someone makes a motion to read the list for discussion, and then you discuss it. If there's ones on there that the council believes should not be on there, delete those. Then open your second reading and read with the amended list or the proper list. We just move to discuss with inclusion of the appendix C. Yes. Move, move to discuss ordinance. Before we already are. Do we need a second or are we discussing? We are. You are discussing. Yeah, okay. We're discussing still. Go ahead. You're recommending taking 17 and a half off based on this. Yes, ma'am. Um, the Planning Commission came to you with this list to tell you that these are the apartments <coughs> in R1. Period. We didn't come to tell you that all of these apartments were here before 2000 or after 2000. We came to tell you these really are the apartment houses you have in R1 today. What happened is in the year 2000, uh, an ordinance was written restricting apartment houses in R1, but at that time, no one had the, the forethought to list the ones that were actually there. So since that year of 2000, some have been added. I can't tell you which ones were added after 2000 and which ones weren't. The ones before 2000 were legal, period. There's nothing you could do about it. They were legal before you made the law, and they still are legal today. So when this came to the Planning Commission, um, because someone thought that there was an illegal apartment house in R1 and they wanted they wanted them to have to have certificate of occupancies they wanted them to have to be you know looked at and deemed safe we went through all of this we went through public hearings we went through meetings we went through all the same discussions that y'all started to have at your last meeting and the truth is, if they were there before 2000, they're legal. You can't go in now and uh, inspect them. You know, there's no court in the world that's going to let you go into somebody's residence. So that couldn't happen. And unless you're going to take all 13 on this list to court and make them prove that they were here before the year 2000, which is a lot of legal expense, which you know, the city would have to to take upon themselves, then I don't know really what else to tell you. So the Planning Commission decided the best thing that we could do was draw a line in the sand, list the ones that really are in your R1 today, and go forward so that the building inspector and the police department can enforce this code because they're having a hard time enforcing it without a list of the ones that were there before 2000 and not. So that is why the list is the list. This really is what is in your R1 today. Ms. Bellis, thank you. Okay, this may be what is really in our R1 today, but it says right here, ordinance number 2114, an ordinance clarifying the qualifying legally non-conforming multifamily dwellings in R1 zoning as of the passing of this ordinance. Well, according to my research, the property in question, which is 17 and a half Elk Street, <clears throat> is not legally non-conforming or qualifying. Um, we have a, a copy of a letter here that was sent by Marion Chrysler um, it's not dated, but we do know that Marion Chrysler was uh, the building official during uh, the Joy administration, which was roughly from 2007 to 2010. 
So we know that that's only, that's within the, within the last four or five years. Would you like me to read that letter to you? Mr. Beatty, I would like to clarify the intent of the current remodeling construction product project on your property at 17 and a half Elk Street and the proposed use of the water and electric meters. You have explained that the water meters will be used for meter one, upstairs dwelling, meter two, downstairs dwelling, meter three, workshop only, meter four, landscaping only. You have explained that the electric meters will be used for meter one, upstairs dwelling, meter two, downstairs dwelling, meter three, workshop only. Your property is located in an R1 Victorian residential zone. Within the city's municipal code, you are allowed to have long-term rental of one apartment within a regi residential structure slash two living spaces. You cannot rent the workshop structure, stru the workshop area as a living space. Three living units in one structure is not permitted, that's underlined, not permitted, without a conditional use permit issued by the Planning Commission Board of Zoning Adjustment, and you must be able to provide adequate off-street parking. According to the Municipal Code, it will not be possible to obtain a CUP for tourist lodging or a bed and breakfast for your building because there are such facilities existing within 200 feet of your property. If you are intending to try to obtain a CUP and use the property for commercial purposes slash an apartment building, all of the wiring, plumbing, and gas lines must be installed by a licensed master electrician and plumbers according to the state law and local municipal code. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to contact me at City Hall. So this document from the time frame of 2007 to 2010 is telling us that as a multifamily dwelling, this property does not, is not qualifying legally non-conforming is what I take away from this. Aside to that, we have a letter that's not on city letterhead undated. Would that hold up in a court of law? Has her signature. So. And we know roughly when she was in, in that position. My question to the city attorney is, would you have to take every single one of these to court and look through all of them before you can single one out just because somebody has one document? That was our stance. We didn't know how to, how to, how to take it all apart unless you took them all to court. And we didn't, that wasn't our purview, that's yours, but I didn't know how to take it apart. We're just telling you well, if we have what apartments there are. blatantly non-conforming, I would think that it would be blatantly non-conforming, not qualifying legally non-conforming. To answer uh, the planning commissioner's uh, question first, no, you would not have to take them all to court. It would be a matter of uh, determining which ones you believe are in violation of the code and bringing those individuals to court. As to the other question, there would be proof problems, whether they would be insurmountable in a court. Uh, that would certainly be arguable, but I think that you would get over the proof problems uh, if you could produce as a witness Ms. Chrysler. The question would then be, can you produce her as a witness? Also, there are neighbors who recall when this went on, and they were, I think they took pictures and documented what happened. So that might also stand, I don't know. That might be additional proof, but I, as I understood the question is, can this letter be introduced? And there would need to be authentication of the letter by some means. But yes, there could be other extraneous proof beyond the letter of whether it was conforming or non-conforming that could be introduced at a, at a trial on the matter. If a charge was brought for improperly occupying the structure with multiple apartments <clears throat> as not allowed by the code. Oh, no. Okay, I'm just going to give it all to you at once and then you can go from there. Uh, I agree, it's, it's tough to decide where you draw the line. Uh, my research of the current list of 13 uh, question would be and has been stated that any of these that were in existence prior to the code change in, uh, I believe it was 1816, that was done in 2000, would exempt these uh, from being 
out of conformance, so therefore we're tasked with making them legally non-conforming. Some of, some of my concerns are the current code requires in multiple family dwellings uh, for units in which these are only defined as units. It doesn't say whether they're a unit with no separate bedroom, uh, one and a half, uh, and this is talking about parking, whether it's no separate bedroom, which I guess you could call an efficiency, whether it's a one bedroom apartment, whether it's a two bedroom apartment, which this is going to, and this, I'm just throwing this out for consideration, we're talking about if they don't currently have the required number of parking spaces, and this is coming from some of the complaints that I've gotten, is that's that much <coughs> more on-street parking on already narrow streets, primarily in the historic district. The other thing is that if they had to go before a CUP application, some of them wouldn't qualify because they do meet, don't meet the over 200 feet requirement. And lastly, of the 13, does ignorance of the law negate following the law? Because you can go through county tax records and the majority of these properties have sold at least once, or I should say changed title, at least once if not more since this code was established. Therefore, if, for lack of a better mm -hmm. Example, if Miss Armstrong sold me a building that she owned in 1999 and I bought it in 2003, do I have to follow the code or am I exempt from it because she didn't bother to tell me that there was a code that said that I had to get a CUP before I could operate that as a apartment? And the other thing that has come up, if they're legally non-conforming, the only way that we can track whether or not they followed the 180-day lack of continuing as a legally non-conforming is that we need to establish some kind of a license fee for people running apartment buildings, which would be, as far as I can tell, the only way to track the 180 day, just like you do a and b or somebody that reports to uh, the CAPC. So without a license category, and the, the only other one is general, and it's really tough to, to define general whenever you've got a situation like this. And uh, I think the list could be narrowed down quite a bit if we took the tax records alone, if ignorance of the law is no excuse. And I do appreciate the effort the Planning Commission put into this. Ms. Bell. I also appreciate Planning Commission. I know they work hard. Um, but I will not I will not vote <coughs> for an ordinance clarifying the qualifying legally nonconforming multifamily <coughs> dwellings in R1 zoning as the passage, passing of this ordinance with this 17 and a half Elk Street on it because I do not believe that it is qualifying legally nonconforming and passing this would make it be what it is not. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair to the people who are qualifying legally nonconforming. Thank you. Should be <coughs> I'll just state that the, the Beatties work for me, but if you're going to hold them to a standard, then you've got to hold all these other properties to a standard that they all have licensed uh, wiring, plumbing, and uh, such in all their properties. Just because somebody found uh, a letter stating at the time of construction or remodeling, uh, you know, if maybe if you dug farther, you'd find it on these other units. So my point is that if you're going to say they're non-conforming because they didn't have a licensed plumber or licensed electrician install the utilities, then you've got to hold all these other properties to the same standard. So you're, never mind. Oh, no. Well, I believe Mr. Berry addressed that at my question last meeting, that if we approved these, that they still would have to follow the building code. But for the record, I'd like to, again, three, three concerns that, that I have that I would like everybody at this table to consider on considering this list. One, under the 180-day rule for a non-conforming unit will be allowed to continue 
with a change of title, even with a change of title until such time it is that abandoned or discontinued for a period of 180 days, after which the use shall not be removed or reviewed except conformity with the regulations of zoning districts. And the only way to track that, like I said before, is with a business license, unless somebody's got a brighter idea. Uh, 14.08.05 non-conforming, uh, you cannot enlarge or alter. A non-conforming structure may not be enlarged or altered. However, any non-conforming structure shall be kept maintained in a good state of repair at all times. Any failure to do so could result in loss of the non-conforming use status at the discretion of the city. And 14.08.06.1, five or more parking spaces visible from the public street, sidewalk, or adjacent property landscaping must be done in accordance with this ordinance article, as it says, which means uh, unless there's appeal to the parking of the parking requirements to the Board of Zoning Adjustment and the CUP is not transferable. And I, I really think that by using a terminology that some people have used to me, which is really not a law term, grandfather, making them legally nonconforming, is basically a slap in the face to a lot of other property owners in that neighborhood. And I agree, everyone ought to be considered on the same merits if we can say, here's the list before 2000 when this ordinance was written, and they've got to follow it after it was in, invoked and there's been a change of ownership, then those owners should have to follow the ordinance, not make them automatically legally nonconforming. No. I'd like the record to reflect that Mr. DeVito is in favor of bending the rules for a personal acquaintance. Thank you. <coughs> Gosh, I thought I stated that they worked for me. Oh, you're not personally acquainted for them? That's enough. <laughs> no comments like that, folks. We talked about this. Hold it down. Can, can, we, can we get what I asked for? <laughs> Since everybody's getting what they want, I asked for the attorney to, to say whether or not ignorance of the law passed the writing of the ordinance for change of ownership is a major consideration whether or not we make these legally nonconforming. If they, if it is, then that list reduces tremendously. If I understand your question correctly, you are stating is your premise that automatically changing ownership would negate their nonconforming status. If uh, I mean, a, a maximum of the law is that ignorance is not a defense. But you are, by your question, inferring that change of ownership automatically removes. I'm not sure that that's what the ordinance says. Can I, can I clarify that, what I, what I was asking? Property that was owned by someone in 1998 before this ordinance was passed, deed was then transferred either by sale or, or whatever in 2005 to someone else and then someone else. Is that fact, you know, number one, we don't even really know when that became an apartment building, but that ordinance was in, fa in fact in effect for two owners, including the current one after the ordinance was passed, and now they're on the list for us to consider making them legally nonconforming. Change of ownership does not in and of itself negate a nonconforming status. It may in this instance, but I don't know that it does from the way the ordinance is written. We'd have to look at that to see whether simply changing ownership means that you cannot continue a non-conforming use. Well, the, the ordinance says right now that to, to be in compliance, they have to go before BOZA to get a CUP to operate as an apartment building. If I converted a, a, a building in R1 Victorian today, I wanted to make it into a 
full-size unit. I'm going to have to go to Boza, if I'm not mistaken, to get a CUP. Correct, Ms. Blankenship. So what I'm saying is somebody that bought this or had this deeded to them after 2000, and say it's in 2005, we don't know if that was operating as an apartment at that point in time, but we know that it's now operating as an apartment since the ordinance was passed under different ownership, but the ownership with no CUP. The ownership doesn't have anything to do with that. The only thing that has to do with that is was it legally operating at the time the ordinance was passed. If it was legally operating as an apartment building when the ordinance passed and you decide you want to become a landlord in R1 and you go to the current owner and buy it, you can buy their rights as an apartment owner unless there is something in the ordinance that I'm not aware of that negates the nonconforming use of one sale of the property. Nonconforming uses can be passed by inheritance, sale, or otherwise transferred, okay. often from multiple owners. I'd like to remind the council that the reason that we brought this to you was to protect your R1. What's happening now is some people, you know, are converting the insides of their homes, possibly, or changing the size of their apartments, possibly, and we don't know and we're not enforcing this because we had no list. We don't know, you know, who was there before and who was not. So we understand the dilemma. We've had this at our... Um, public hearings, you know, why should somebody get something that they're not entitled to? But because the sitting council, when they wrote the ordinance in 2000, did not draw up a list, then the enforcement side of it is having a very difficult time. Actually, they're just not enforcing this part of it because there was no list of what was there. If they were there before 2000, we can't require them to have parking spots. We can't require them to have CUP. We can't require them to do anything. And so that is the reason that it's at your table, to try to protect our R1, not to do favors for anybody or to help anybody or any of that. We're trying to protect it. This is the only solution. If you take a property off, you know, we'll still go forward, and then that property will probably, you know, be prosecuted. But we are trying to protect it, and that is the goal. So just keep that in mind. So, so what I'm assuming is correct. You've provided us the best list you could come up with as far as existing apartment buildings operating in R1 Victorian. Correct. Okay. And we had. You many aren't necessarily going along with the idea that they need to be made legally non-conforming. I'm telling you, these are your apartments okay. in R1. Mr. Levito, you had your hand up while ago. No. Okay. Ms. Mountains. I, I appreciate the efforts of the Planning Commission, and I'm not saying that you've done anything wrong. I, I'm just saying that I don't want to do anything wrong. I know. I don't want to but what is the goal? Take, turn something into something it should have been. <coughs> that, that doesn't seem right to me. Thank you and so we're much. We're apparently at a stalemate here, so. And one, one last comment to echo what, what Ms. Blankenship was saying. We're in the same position, and I believe that, I don't remember if it was in the vision plan that was adopted or not, but <clears throat> we're faced with the same type of situation and continually being confronted with changing beautiful Victorian homes that people come in and buy and then decide, oh, I want to make this into a anything, whether it's an apartment building, a art studio, or a gallery, or whatever. And I think this whole issue has brought up something that needs to be addressed somewhere, whether it's at this table and planning or wherever, that we've got to, we've got to define what we're going to do with our R1 Victorian houses as far as allowable uses, period. Well, I think we are defining them. I think that's what this is all about. Started. You've got two choices. You've got apartment house or you got bed and breakfast or overnight lodging. Three choices. Uh, that's about it. But that didn't bring us back to this subject. And um, I was going, 
my comments was removing this base was based on this letter um, and until it was pointed out there wasn't really a good date on it but it appears to me that this date and the property owner mr. Beatty had already agreed that this is a two unit apartments that one unit is going to be a workshop meter where there's the meters are there's going to become workshops so therefore it's it's basically an apartment two two units which is allowable by right of ordinance going into this discussion I'm having some thoughts in here Mr. Ponell asked about how you can tell when something has changed. Well, one of the reasons and one of the ways you can do is find out when the meters were set, uh, electrical meters, um, water meters. And I'm, when this came up, and this is just something for Ms. Blankenship to throw back in the back of her mind, is that the utility company should never approve installing more meters on a unit until they get approval from the city building inspector planning commission that would take care of not ever having i mean at least for the meters anyway it's not going to necessarily stop multifamily from happening without us knowing it but it's a good start so i'm not sure i bet we could go to uh, the electric company and find out when meter number three was established and possibly the same thing with uh, uh, with our water works and find out when they installed the water meters three and four however that still goes back to this letter saying at this point in year 2007 to 2010 when Marion Chrysler was there this was being used as a duplex and therefore it loses its non-conforming status even if these meters were put in in 1920 it doesn't matter because they have lost their non-conforming status by going back to the duplex status um, two things other things now i'm a little confused about multifamily doesn't have anything to do with 200 feet with conditional use permits that i'm aware of um, and the other thing is it goes before the planning commission instead of both of but other than that that's that's my concept Mr. Vito had your hand up. Well, I'll just make the point that you can't track them by meters because some apartments rent with utilities provided so no but you can tell when the meters were put in can't track them by meters can we track them by yards <laughs> Mr. Pena. Uh, just just for info on my question of the 13 properties if if the premise of change of ownership therefore needing to be aware of the ordinance that was written in 2000 10 of the 13 units on the proposed list or not proposed list the identified list excuse me of the apartments that are operating would should not be considered as legally non-conforming because their ownership changed at least once if not twice after the ordinance was in effect <coughs> I like to see this thing rewritten for the ones they say is not conforming to get them off the list. We've been doing this for about 40 minutes talking about this. They got one darn thing done. So I'd like to see this brought back uh, to the September 15th meeting. Is that a motion? That's a motion, yes. Okay. Second. Motion made and seconded to postpone this until. September the 15th. Is that correct, sir? Discussion. Yes. Sir. I certainly don't want to hear myself talk, but it's a motion at that point to have have what done. What what will we see oh. on September 15th? Are you hoping? To? Yeah. Have uh, have somebody look into this again. If they don't feel they are uh, up for non-compliance, then take them.